Um, leaving Miami, coming up uh, the turnpike, it was it was nice to then head into Stewart, crossing over the St. Lucie, crossing into over the Indian River Lagoon. Why is this community so vital to the future or to the health of the Everglades? Well, Leon, uh, it's kind of a nice open question. Thank you. Um, but we're basically, you know, this estuary and, and the St. Lucie estuary and Indian River Lagoon here, we're not connected to any part of the Everglades many years ago, except for the watershed down to the South Fork connected down to the Loxahatchee would used to kind of grab, gradually flow into the Everglades system. But, you know, when they built the canal and connected Lake Okeechobee to the St. Lucie Estuary, that's when that real big connection started. And as you know, back then when, when the estuary was not connected, it was pristine. We had the North South Fork come together here at Stewart. That was beautiful, but back then when they connected the, the lake and their engineering prowess, prowess was to drain the Everglades, control Lake Okeechobee, they built the Hoover Dyke in 1930s. And when they connected the, the St. Lucie Canal to the South Fork, they really had no understanding of how that would impact uh, the St. Lucie Estuary. And so the engineering of it was when the lake rises too high and they want to discharge the water and, and, and they put Put it out to the east coast to the St. Lucie Estuary and to the west coast to the to the Caloosahatchee. And this was the engineered system. And then south of the lake, as you know, we've drained the Everglades uh, by draining that river of grass and putting all that water out to the east and west coast. And and unfortunately, this estuary has a balance. It's connected through um, through the Saint, to the ocean through the St. Lucie Inlet and other inlets, and that creates this mixture or balance between the salt water and the ocean and the fresh water and the, and the drainage of the estuary. And that's the nursery grounds for all our fish and shellfish and all the wonderful things that we have. And at this end, we're at the north end of these tropical systems and temperate systems that interact right here. So we have one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in North America right here from 10 miles from the radius from where we're standing. So this is such an important ecosystem and what happened was when they connected the, it to the lake and they started draining the system and started artificially inflowing these waters into the system, it created a huge imbalance and we lost habitat. And we continue to lose habitat such as seagrass and oyster reefs, which create the nursery grounds for all of these fish and shellfish that are so valuable to our, our coastal ecosystem here. So what happened was is we got involved and in, right away and this county and stepped up and began to as soon as a comprehensive everglades plan was passed and, and we had a plan to go forward to restore the everglades restore the flows back in year 2000 as you know this county stepped up we started getting our first project one of the first projects authorized in 2007 was the indian river lagoon south project and it was in, in this area where you heard mentioned the C44, C23, 24 projects, things that are components of that to, to try to restore the Everglades. And this county also stepped up to funding and they put forward $75 million in order to buy the land necessary to restore some of this habitat in Allapata and other places as a part of that plan. So not only did they start shouting loud and clear that we need to restore the Everglades and have that flow go south and not come to the estuaries, they also started to put the money where the mouth is, if you will. And many of us, including folks here in this room and at the panel were very adamant to get this going. So we formed a Rivers Coalition in 98, as you know, that, that was a year like 2013 when huge discharges came out of the estuary and it just brought together all the, the realtors, the, the chambers of commerce, the, the, all the environmental groups, we all sat around the table together, realizing this is such an important issue that we need to do to restore this Everglades system and not have these uh, damaging discharges from the estuary. You, you touch on the coalition of interests that came together in this county, in this area. Uh, and we see that now over the last number of years, but it really started here in Martin County. And I, I, I know in, in the late 90s, there were discharges, but I wanna, I wanna go back to the lost summer because uh, that was a turning point. So Jackie, my question to you, and I'll have a follow-up to this, but um, maybe speak to why that was such a defining moment in this effort, the summer of 2013. 
Thank you. Can you hear me okay? So that is like one of my favorite questions to answer. So 2013, the lost summer, they called it the lost summer because the summer was lost mostly for the children. They couldn't go to sailing camp. They couldn't go in the river. My, uh, my sister's daughter, Evie, was um, working at the Environmental Studies Center as a helper at that time. She was in high school. And I remember her coming home and telling me that the, the little kids went bowling because they couldn't go in the river that year. And I think we all just became furious. You know, this is ridiculous. And Lake Okeechobee had been dumping, it ended up dumping for almost eight months that year into the river and the river looked like coffee. And there were uh, little bits of toxic algae along the edges. And uh, my husband at the time uh, had an, an, an airplane that uh, I had not gotten up in. And I decided, and you know, I wanna say right off the bat that the only reason I'm here is for the two, is because of the two gentlemen around me and all the people who have helped me along this way. I was the mayor of Souls Point. I was getting involved in all this like Merritt, uh, the same type of way. And then, you know, you're inspired by people to my right and to my left. And I decided that I was gonna get in that airplane. And uh, I was terrified because they're little airplanes. And it's like a Snoopy plane and uh, you, it is. And you're like, you're like, oh my gosh, if this thing goes down, you know, we're dead fast. And uh, so got in the plane and started taking pictures and believe it or not, in 2013, there weren't, social media wasn't as uh, pumped up as it is right now. And uh, so we started taking those pictures and sharing them, sharing them on social media, but also just in email chains. And because I was plugged in with the, the local governments, like the Treasure Coast Council of Local Governments and the Florida League of Cities, we were able to get these things out wide and far. And the pictures are extremely disturbing. To this time in history, those pictures from 2013 are some of the worst pictures. And um, it just, I'm not, it was a lot of factors coming together, the Rivers Coalition, um, the Everglades Foundation saw what was happening here and they brought us in and they put us in their videos uh, in front of all of the people down there uh, at the Everglades Foundation. And so it just started building and building and building. And then the River Warriors were a group that started of just people on the street. And the incredible thing about it all was it brought together all these people who would have never been together under any other circumstance. And we were all different from different backgrounds, uh, different places. And it, we just became empowered and incited. And Maggie Hercella, of course, you know, was like, she came back into the mix and it, it was like a fire. It was like a fire. And uh, I really do credit the Everglades Foundation with making us bigger than we were because we were already catching a lot of attention. But when Eric put us all on the videos and showed what was going on, like uh, the Indian River Keeper, Marty Baum, Mike Connor, uh, it just, it became, um, it really, it's a movement that happened. It is a movement and it is still alive today. And uh, I think that when I go to my grave, these times will be the most meaningful of my life because it was authentic. You know what I'm saying? It was authentic. All of these people coming together to change things. And it led to Governor DeSantis, uh, no, not getting into the party part of it, but it led into uh, the, the, the highest levels of government knowing that if they didn't have the, the estuaries in their political plan, they were not going to get voted into office. And so we have changed the world. We have, but now we just have to keep it going. Well, I'll, I'll say too that um, when you rang the bell in 13 and Mark and Leon and the Rivers kids, uh, when, the, when the bell was rung, um, if the immediate reaction wasn't to solve it, we had discharges that followed the lost summer of 13. We had discharges in 
16 and 18 and 20, I believe even 21, it was multiple years that we were seeing the harmful dumping of Okeechobee water uh, to, the, to the east and west. Florida Bay, 60,000 acres of dead seagrass to the south. Um, but uh, I do want to talk about a def another defining moment, and that was after Governor DeSantis took office and he cleaned house at the South Florida Water Management District. I think that was a um, that was a, a monumental moment in this effort. Uh, nine men and women replaced with nine men and women who uh, one of which is here, Jackie. So speak to um, your role now, uh, almost 10 years later after the lost summer where instead of raising the concern, you're now at the table to be part of the solution. Uh, give us a perspective as a member of the governing board and how progress is proceeding. I have to say that I forgot to note the River Kids and the River Kids were probably the number one thing that changed the heart of uh, the politicians, particularly Senator Joe Negron. So, um, and the River Kids came when we had our first uh, meeting at uh, the South Florida Water Management District. And wasn't that a proud day for me to be standing there with them in the um, chambers of the South Florida Water Management District? And I never expected to be in this position, okay? And what I think I bring to the table is that I, I understand the power of words and the first thing that I, I help to do with the whole uh, board, and we have a great board, is almost immediately we changed our mission statement. And we changed our mission statement to include safeguard and restore the waters and environment right in the very first line. Because prior to that, for probably 70 years, it was flood control and water supply. And of course, those things are the, the reason that uh, the agency uh, exists as part of its responsibilities. But since SERP and all, we also have the responsibilities of restoration. And so with that mission statement changing, then the strategic plan changed. Okay, so we went through all the different changes and what happens there is when staff looks to do things, they look to those documents to make their decisions. And so right off the bat, we were able to put the focus on restoration and safeguarding the water. And that is a huge shift since uh, earlier times. Um, Leon, after, again, just to go back to those, um, those early years, if you will, in the last 10 years, 2013, um, there was a partnership with the Florida Association of Realtors to um, provide data points of the economic loss to real estate in Martin County and in Lee County. And that report shows almost a billion dollars of negative damage to real estate due to the dumping of water from Lake Okeechobee. As a longtime realtor, um, speak to the importance of having that industry, um, that sector be part of this, um, this debate and this solution. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I just have to uh, digress and say that when I read in the newspaper that Governor DeSantis fired the whole South Florida Water Management Governing Board, I almost cried. I mean, I literally almost cried. My wife was sitting right next to me and I couldn't believe it. It was, it was just wonderful. Um, well, the Rivers Coalition formed in 1998 um, and I have to give a shout out to the late great Henry Kamak okay because Henry that was back in my fishing days and I Henry and I were friends I bought all my tackle up at the snook nook and uh, when we had those horrendous discharges in 1998 my phone started ringing twice a day and it was Henry Leon what are the realtors going to do what are you guys going to do and 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 I have to credit Henry as being the catalyst that formed the Rivers Coalition. Um, you probably didn't know that, but Henry was just just so annoying. Uh, <laughs> and, and in a way, if any of you know Henry, in a way that only Henry could be. So uh, we called a meeting at the Realtor Association um, and I invited the Chambers of Commerce, Mark Perry. Mark Perry was in the room, uh, the late great Maggie Herchala was in the room, and that was the formation of the Rivers Coalition. And we realized at that time that 
we need to involve the, the business community, not only the realtors, but the Chambers of Commerce, the Treasure Coast Builders Association. I can go on and on. Our, our initial board was a, a, of the Rivers Coalition at that time was, uh, I think, nine members. And, uh, and uh, I've since stepped down as chairman after uh, uh, nearly two decades. Mark graciously uh, agreed to take on chairman of that role. But the, uh, the organization has grown to how many now? Oh, 105 members. 105. We start, yeah, 105 organizations representing hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so at that time, Henry being the catalyst, and Henry was in the room, Maggie Herchala, Mark, um, we formed the Rivers Coalition, and we thought that the most important um, uh, entity we could bring in was a very, very strong business presence because protecting our environment here in Martin County and statewide and nationally is not only vital for our quality of life, it's, it's, it's uh, essential to our long-term economic sustainability, especially someplace like Martin County and especially like the state of Florida. Um, that's, that's what is the driving force for our, for our economy. Um, so we went to um, the Florida Association of Realtors and we established at the time, which I, and I went as chairman of the Rivers Coalition and also representing the Realtor Association of Martin County. When I was, when I went through the Florida Association of Realtors uh, organizational documents, there was one glaring um, missing piece. And there was no, there wasn't anything in their organizational documents addressing, uh, addressing the environment and addressing clean water. So we went up and we uh, were able to get the Florida Association of Realtors to do a study. And we were able to get the Florida Association of, uh, of Realtors to implement and put in their organizational documents the first uh, a language addressing water quality and quality of life, and that was a big and that was a big victory for us. And and the Florida Association of Real and not very many people know that, but the Florida Association of Realtors does have a lot of horsepower, um, and um, so we were uh, very uh, to this day I'm still very proud. I like to call our realtor friends uh, the foot soldiers in this effort because um, as algae was impacting. Martin County, Lee County, uh, real estate was not being transacted. So realtors were also at the forefront saying this has to change. We need to redirect water flowing south. When Senate Bill 10 was introduced, realtors were in Tallahassee urging passage and authorization of a reservoir to the south. Um, how many people in the room or virtually know what LOSUM means? Everyone know the acronym? Good. So this is a crowd that we don't have to get uh, too detailed in the explanation. I want to talk now about what's been going on in Tallahassee as it relates to Lowson. Those of you that are watching online, if you have a question, uh, do type it into the chat and I'll, I'll field those here in a couple of moments. Um, almost three years, transparent, open process, 30 public meetings, 50,000 public comments, a whole host of hydrological models in Lowson, Army Corps of Engineers, South Florida Water Management District, working toward a balanced approach on how water from the lake will be managed over the course of 12 months, not six, but over the course of 12 months. I want to speak to, um, I want to talk, Mark, I want to ask you first, um, the importance of the LOSUM plan that was announced in the fall and what it means for the St. Lucie Estuary for Martin County once the plan as uh, offered is fully adopted. Well, thank you, Erica. Yeah, the, the, the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual is a a long acronym for talking about how the Corps of Engineers will manage the lake. And when it gets to certain ele elevations at certain times of the year, they have to make decisions on how much water to release from the lake so that it contains it in flood control and we don't um, end up topping the dike, so to say, so that it actually hurts and harms people around the lake. So the idea of this water control plan has been in place for many, many decades and years. Uh, since they started. And those of us who have been around have seen different models and runs of this Lake Okeechobee uh, regulation schedule and run 25 and the, the uh, basically Lures 2008 Lake Okeechobee uh, schedule 2008, which was the last time they changed the schedule or allowed this process to go on. But as Eric mentioned recently, this loathsome process came together, the Corps of Engineers, the district, and 
engaged all the stakeholders around the lakes to begin to weigh into this process. They've done a tremendous amount of meetings and model runs, as Eric mentioned, and, and it's really critical to, to understand that. This is monumental. This is, the Corps of Engineers never used to do this before. They used to just go behind those doors, make up a schedule, regulate the lake the way they're going to do it for their purposes and be done. With. And we all had to just accept that. But now this process has really opened this, this door for all of us to be engaged. And, and the core is really listening and doing a great job to pull this together. What is finally coming down to and what we'll see this year at the end of the year is towards adoption of this regulation, new regulation schedule, which will hopefully balance the whole process out. Our goals and objectives in this have been send the water south where it used to go. All that water from Lake Okeechobee, from the big watershed that comes into the lake, uh, billions of gallons a year that comes in, needs to stop at the lake, but it needs to flow south and not be discharged east and west. So we've, we've been very vocal in this whole process. The Corps listened, the district's listened, everybody's listening to say, okay, we can possibly do this and have zero discharges at most the whole range of the operational schedule zero discharges to the St. Lucie estuary and only some stopping all the harmful discharges to the Caloosahatchee side while putting most of this water south. That zero discharges to us, to the St. Lucie, means a whole lot. As you've heard from Mayor Matheson and others, if we can stop that largest input to St. Lucie estuary, Indian River Lagoon in the south here, if we can stop that flow coming into the estuary, the largest inflow we've done a monumental job to help this estuary. So they've listened, and I think we're gonna see that, that zero discharges to the estuary. And it's only at that high, high stage of the lake in those critical times when absolutely necessary to release the water for public safety that we may see some discharges to the, to the St. Lucie. But this loathsum schedule, if we can hold it together and keep it going, then it'll, it'll you know, provide all the flood protection, all the water supply they need, at the same time, stop those harmful discharges to the West Coast to the Caloosahatchee and zero discharges to the East Coast and sending that water south to the Everglades that needs the water, particularly in the dry season, to allow that slow flow river of grass to continue all the way down to Florida Bay, which actually needs that as the estuary down there too. So that's the Lowson process right now as it's going forward. Hopefully we'll see that at the end of this year, we'll see the uh, finalization of that and we'll start our new schedule next year. I, I wish you had received the invitation to go to Tallahassee to explain what you just said in less than five minutes to members of the Florida Senate. It would have gone a long way. Uh, would they have to, listened? Well, yeah. that's another question. Um, Jackie, I want to turn to you as a member of the governing board on an important point within the Lowson plan as is. Um, there's concern, there's some concern in Tallahassee that as the lake is lowered, that somehow the state of Florida is going to turn over our water rights to the federal government. Uh, this LOSM process is a partnership between the Army Corps and the Water Management District. It, it transcends political parties in the White House. Um, but maybe speak to the role of the Water Management District when the lake gets at to, to a lower level, when there's drought conditions. What is the role of the district at that point? I have to. Um... First, just I think it's really important that everybody thinks about the history of, of why things are like they are. And um, my mom's a historian, and so everything, my brother who's here in the room and my sister, you, you, you can't just look at things face value. You have to look at like what led up to it. So just in a nutshell, the, um, the South Florida Water Management District started as the um, Everglades drainage district, okay? The Everglades drainage district back in like 1913. And prior to that, the legislature had kind of given people uh, permission, permits, if those even existed at that time, to just drain the lands as needed for um, farming and subsistence survival. And then later, after the great flood of 1947, uh, the, the district now became the Central and South Florida Flood Program, okay? The Central and South Florida Flood Program. And uh, 
that is when they built all of those giant canals and uh, they added more later. But that is what, when you're like flying over in an airplane and you see all the giant canals, that's when that happened. It wasn't until the 70s uh, that the that Mr. Askew or Governor Askew created the water management districts. Okay, and so the South Florida Water Management District became itself at that time. But we have to remember that the soul of the South Florida Water Management District is the Everglades Drainage District and the Central and South Florida Flood Control uh, District. And then the other four districts they just started out. And to this day, the South Florida Water Management District is like intense. I mean, it's almost like its own. I always joke around and say it's a city state. I mean, it is advanced. And because of all of um, the history and everything that's happened, uh, the district as a local sponsor, this is the key word, with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, for Lake Okeechobee and uh, dealing with uh, SERP, which is building Everglades restoration. I would say, even though the federal government, of course, is above us, so to speak, the South Florida Water Management District is an equal player. I mean, because they're so advanced and often the, the Army Corps is relying on the district to do things, even with the low sum process. Most of the uh, modelers were um, South Florida Water Management District um, employees. They weren't Army Corps employees. And so the bottom line is the Army Corps over these years has developed a tremendous amount of respect for the, the uh, professionalism, the scientific abilities and background and historic uh, conditions of the South Florida Water Management District. So now to answer Eric's question, the responsibility of the South Florida Water Management District within that partnership with Lake Okeechobee specifically is when water gets into a low, a water shortage band, that it's the district who doles out the water. Okay, it's the district who doles out the water to agriculture and for water supply, which would be like um, West Palm Beach and uh, filling up the conservation areas because the water conservation areas uh, they pushed the, the water down so that the wells in Broward and Miami-Dade and that everything is functioning. And also the Caloosahatchee River, that's an environmental um, need, but they need water, unlike the St. Lucie. And, and there are other environmental conditions. So there's controversy about uh, the district and the Army Corps. I say there's a long history here. There's a long history here and they will work it out and we are never going to be giving our water rights of the state to the, um, you know, to the federal government. Uh, we, it, it, this has been a dance, uh, a work for generations and it continues to be, but we can't dance the same dance we danced in 1913 or in 1948. We're dancing a different dance today because conditions are different. So we have to adjust. And that's what the South Florida Water Management is trying to do, keeping in mind its uh, responsibilities for water supply and uh, uh, flood control, which is a no brainer, of course. But now we're trying to help the environment and we have to. Um, Leon, before what, I guess after the false flag was raised in Tallahassee that um, in the form of Senate Bill 2508 that was gonna um, thwart the loathsome process that Mark and Jackie has just talked about, the business community, particularly fishing guides, rallied and went to Tallahassee to let the Florida Senate know that we were not gonna be, um, we weren't gonna be uh, swayed by misinformation and efforts by the sugar industry in particular to keep Lake Okeechobee artificially high for their own purposes. Um, speak to the importance of the business community. I know you have experience with the realtors, but speak more broadly about why the business community needs to be engaged on these issues, why they need to make themselves present in Tallahassee and in Washington, and what's been the difference by having the business community engaged? 
great, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Typically, and as history tells us, the, um, um, it was mostly the environmentalists that were pushing for uh, regulatory changes. When we first, the, the pretext to the Rivers Coalition forming in 1998 was to bring the business community in. Before that, about a decade before, it was the St. Lucie River Initiative, which was uh, Bud Jordan, Kevin Henderson, and those gentlemen that, uh, that spearheaded that, that, uh, uh, those efforts. And the St. Lucie River Initiative was, business, was, was, was primarily business organizations. And then when we put together the realtors, uh, when, we, when, we, when the realtors put together the Rivers Coalition and called that meeting, when we looked around the room and we realized that we needed to have this be a more broad, uh, a broad representation of business, environmental, and and, and fishing guides. Um, so the, the the importance of bringing the credibility, I think, the credibility of the efforts is what the business community brought to the table. It, don't you think? I mean, it, it, it wasn't, uh, and I'm just playing at this because I didn't expect that question. But, but I think, I think, I think, you know, the environmentalists were there, the captains were always, uh, you know, were always uh, raising hell, pardon my French. And Mark and I were uh, reminiscing about some of the uh, behaviors of some of the fishing guides back in the early days of the Rivers Coalition meetings, which I will not, oh which, which I will not share uh, on video or in a, 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 a this, but we were, we were laughing about yeah, how, were, how, how, vocal. how we are vocal is a, is a nice way of putting it, but how rambunctious they were. But I think what the business involvement in this effort was, is it brought credibility to the effort, credibility to the cause um, because of the, of the monetary loss that, that we all would suffer uh, with, with the bad environment. Because you come to Florida because you want to be outside, because you want to enjoy the water, you want to enjoy our wonderful environment, and having pollution at any level, especially in our waters, which is the lifeblood of our community. In Martin County, we've got two major rivers that converge here. I think we're the only county in the state that has it, you know, and, uh, and I think it's just important, and I think the credibility that the business community brought to the efforts really played a big part in having it be successful and and having and 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 watching the the the, the progress that all of these projects have done someone like myself has been involved with, uh, was involved for decades and have been able to I, I i keep telling mark you know the, the old man is watching and, and i am very proud of everything that the rivers coalition is, is doing now and the and the efforts um and i, I think that the to answer your question, I think it brought credibility to the to the fight. No doubt, and and I'll say too that in the Senate Bill Ten debate under the leadership of Joe Negron, uh, to be able to have the business community talk about the return on investment, the number of jobs that were being uh, that would benefit from just reengineering the way water flows, ending pollution, ending toxic algae was also critical. Um, with about the ten to fifteen minutes of time that we have remaining, I'd like to open it up to anyone here in the room, um, we do have a question that I'll get to hear from our friends that are on Zoom. Any, uh, any questions, uh, John? Those of you that are on, on virtual online with us, um, John Keller mentioned, and I, I did have that in my close, but you, you will, we'll get to it now, which is important. Um, Maggie Hercella, as we all know, passed uh, over the weekend. Um, many of you in the room had a much um, stronger, longer relationship uh, with Maggie, but I'll just say that my time with her, I, 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 I cherished it. She was... Um, extremely important in her recommendations, in her leadership, in her experiences. Um, this community has suffered a great loss with her departure, but um, we all stand on her shoulders as well as shoulders of others who have passed before her. But 
um, do let, let's take a moment to um, remember Maggie Hercella and the impact that she had in this community. Thank you. Eric, can I just share a quick Maggie sure. story? I'll make it very, very fast. A lot of you know the story. This was back in 1998 when we started the Rivers Coalition. Maggie was in the room. And uh, we were going up to Washington to uh, give a presentation to uh, a congressional committee. Maggie got wind of this. So she comes up to me and she said, uh, are you going to Washington? I said, yeah. She said, how would you like to meet uh, the Attorney General, Janet Reno? <laughs> I said, uh, yeah. So my wife and I are in Washington. I get a phone call from Attorney General Reno's assistant. She said, Mr. Abood, when would you like to come in to see the Attorney General? And I was, uh, whatever she'll see me. So we made an appointment. We went to the Justice Department, my wife, Georgia, and I. And we were sitting in the lobby, and Attorney General Reno comes out says, I'm so glad we could make this happen. Evidently, Maggie, in her infinite wisdom and infinite just Maggie-ness, had given Attorney General Reno all of the background on my wife and myself. And my wife is an artist. She has an art studio here. So the Attorney General took the time to walk us through the, her chambers, pointing out all of the different artwork on the wall and we sat in her private chambers and above, and I remember this like it was yesterday, above the fireplace was the national portrait of Bobby Kennedy. Mm. And she took the time and just so gracious, so nice. And it was, and my wife and I often reflect on that as being one of the highlights of our life. So that is my, right. that is my Maggie That's Herchella. Right. That is my Maggie Herchella story. I'm sorry to <laughs> no, not no, no. Rest, no. but I think it's a great story and it, and it epitomizes Maggie. So that's all. I, mean, I just had to, I had to share that with you. Thank you for sharing that. Questions, Mayor. Best, sure. way, best way to protect the future water supply for the uh, drinking water for the millions of people that reside south of uh, South. Well, of you, yeah, as we described it, you know, when we built the dike around the lake and we cut off that and we began draining the Everglades, of course, it, it cut off that water supply recharge, the mm -hmm. recharge of, of the Biscayne Aquifer that supplies the whole Lower East Coast, over 9 million people depend on the water that is hydrated in the Everglades. So the top of the Biscayne Aquifer is right in the middle of the heart of the Everglades. And if we don't restore that flow to the south and, and get that recharge going, those well fields in Hollywood and everywhere else begin to dry up. They've had to move their well fields further and further uh, west so that they get um, no saltwater intrusion. Um, but it's, it's just imperative that that it be understood that to, to restore the Everglades is to restore and, and have that water supply available to those over 9 million people in South Florida that depend on that, that water going south. I mean, before the, the lake was built, that river grass used to flow at about 2.74 billion gallons a day. Today, that flow is minimized to a trickle, only less than probably 100 million gallons a day. And so it's, it's a huge importance that we all understand we have to restore that flow south that used to nature take its course. It took 16 months to go that 110 miles, one, one mile every four days. It flowed very, very slowly. And at that time would rehydrate the aquifer below and evaporate up into the sky and recharge the clouds. I mean, it was just a whole ecosystem that you brought up that we really need to understand and restore. That's, that's the importance of restoring everything. Good. Yes, sir.
Yes. 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 So the question is referring to how the lotion process and how restoration is going to necessarily restore some of the, the, the Florida Bay and Biscayne Bay and others at the south end of Florida. As Eric mentioned early on, we lost over 50,000 acres of seagrass and one of the world's largest seagrass communities in, in the world is in between the Keys and the tip of Florida in Florida Bay. Over 500,000 acres of seagrass. And as I mentioned earlier, that's so important to the, the fisheries and the, and the eco, ecology of our whole system. And so if, if we start losing that, and because there's not enough flow, that water has gone hyper saline. And what caused that seagrass is when that went from 35 parts to 80 parts per thousand in salinity, it, it started killing that seagrass. And that sounds crazy, but that started what happened. We needed that flow from the Everglades into Florida Bay to rehydrate it. So it's so critical, as you mentioned, to, to restore this, this low sum process, Lake Okeechobee regulation process to put most all of that water going south needs to go south and slowly rehydrate the Everglades in order to get to Florida Bay, to get to Biscayne Bay and re recharge those uh, estuaries with the correct amount of uh, fresh water flow from the land, meeting that uh, salt water from the ocean environment. Again, creating those. If you've ever been down to the tip of Florida and the Everglades, those 10,000 islands of these mangrove tree islands, you can get lost in there. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. You, you want to be careful navigating through there. But it's that, that just imagine that fresh water coming from the Everglades and, and meeting that salt water from the ocean the richness and diversity of not only the seagrass, but the mangrove shore. I mean, it's just, to me, when I think of the historical way that used to be, to me, that's what I want to see happen. And that's why I'm so ad advocate about, let's restore those Everglades ecosystems. I was, um, I was driving to Naples uh, a couple of weeks ago and I went over these beautiful bridges along Tanami Trail. I mean, yep. these, these bridges are gorgeous, yeah, aren't they? Aren't it. they wonderful? Yeah. They, they, they pulled the plug uh, to allow this fresh water to flow. For the first time in 100 years, water is flowing into Everglades National Park. I think to the question, LOSUM is going to provide tremendous benefit, but we have infrastructure now in place to allow more of a sheet flow to go forward. The Central Everglades plan is removing all of the dams and dikes in the River of Grass in that central part the bridges, these massive pump stations that are being retrofitted or rebuilt to allow more water flowing. And then don't forget, and this community led the effort here, Senate Bill 10, this reservoir south of the lake that we need the federal government to start moving on tomorrow, that's gonna be the source of water on a regular basis, complementing again, the work of LOSUM and having that manual to deliver fresh water throughout the course of the year. It's a tremendous benefit to this community, but also to our neighbors and friends down in South Florida, uh, vitally important. Yes, sir. Give a commercial for the water management district. It's, it's extensive. There's almost 2000 people that work for the district. And um, the, the budget is, um, you know, billions of dollars. And uh, a lot of that money, uh, of course, is money that's, when you say that it's important, that it's coming also from, uh, it's for SERP. Do you know what I'm saying? It's for the Central Everglades Restoration Plan. And so you have money coming. This is part of the, uh, the struggle with the, uh, this bill that we're talking about, this 2508. And maybe Eric can talk a little bit about it. The amount, I'm gonna be straight here, you know, over the years, the amount of money that the district receives has shifted. And it's become more and more and more, of course, but it's become less ad valorem taxes from the people. Okay, and that sounds good. You're like, oh, great, no more taxes. You know, none of us want taxes. But at the same time, more of the money has been coming from the legislature. Okay, and so the more money that's coming from the legislature, 
the more they feel that even though the district organizationally falls underneath the governor, okay, we fall under the executive branch, the legislature is saying, we're giving you all your money. You have to do what we say. If you don't do what we say, we're not giving you the money. And that is the really hard thing. Eric, can you talk to that sure. a little bit? And can you talk about, I, I couldn't remember in a, um, yesterday with uh, Friends of the Everglades, is it 70% that's coming from, from Tallahassee, the, yeah. these ad valorem rollback rollback started under Rick Scott, and they've continued. So the 16 counties that make up the water management district, 16 counties, including the largest counties in the state of Florida and South Florida, are supposed to be covering the costs of Everglades restoration. Uh, the people living in Pensacola or in Jacksonville are supposed to be deferring the cleanup or the efforts to those of us that live in the district. But as Jackie has outlined as ad valorem has been rolled back, it's been shifted to Tallahassee having to come through. Um, what this 2508, and if you're following the legislative process, there are only a few more weeks left in Tallahassee, so that's the good news. Um, but 20, 2508 was introduced just a couple of weeks ago, and um, the highlights of that bill, it's, it was going to um, thwart the loathsome process. It was going to put a security blanket back in to the water distribution for the sugar industry instead of having it be sending uh, south as Mark talked about. But most egregious was the uh, taking of hostage the dollars to go to Everglades restoration. So what the language says, the governor's asked for $660 million for Everglades restoration for projects. Unless you pass 2508, there's no money appropriated. It would zero out those dollars. So Gail Harrell, needs to be we need to encourage gail harrell in the next two weeks here in the legislative process to remove the handcuffs that have been placed by the florida senate on everglades funding it's contingent on 2508 passing now 2508 is a christmas tree of a whole host of issues but again the the, the ones that we were concerned about have been removed they filed an amendment last week the senate stripped out two provisions. There's two remaining that have to remove. One is this budget uh, situation. And then, quite frankly, if that takes place when the House and Senate meet for negotiations, we've at least, uh, we've at least avoided the concern that um, the community has raised since the legislation was introduced. So if, if anything, there's any homework today, do reach out to Gail Harrell encourage her to uh, stay strong, remove the provision that's holding Everglades funding hostage, and uh, let's make sure 2508 doesn't set us back. Because quite frankly, all the momentum that we've been experiencing over the last five to six years um, would take a step back if, um, if this bill were to pass as currently written. Yeah, I'd say also not just Gail Harrell is a, a one of the senators, there's 38 other senators. There's sure. a, there's a Florida has uh, 40 senators and 120 representatives, the Florida representatives. So the House, is, as Eric said, is considering their appropriations bill, which will match up with the Senate bill. Um, but we don't want this language in Senate bill um, to, to curtail or hold the purse strings unless the district complies with providing enough water supply for these other agricultural needs. We, we've got to put the pressure on that they caps for clean water many people went up to tallahassee eric was there and 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 they listened and they did change it a bit but we got to stay diligent for the next few weeks here while the session is on to make sure that that bill that goes forward the appropriation bill releases that for the district to have the funding they need to do the projects without you know the criteria that they have to meet these other conditions for agricultural water supply so we got to make sure that that uh, that stays clean going through there in the appropriation process and doesn't get hijacked again. But this is how, unfortunately, the state legislature works. It's so so under the, the kind of table in a way that they just kind of behind closed doors, they'll put in something, try to slip it through. And unless it becomes available and somebody gets a word of it and mobilizes up there, they'll have it slip through. And next thing you know, it's into law and everybody complies. I do want to say in the district, um, even though as the funding is mentioned, you know, the 50-50 partnership is between the federal level and the district. 
So it's the federal government putting up 50% and the, and the state putting up 50% for the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. So these projects, these billion dollar projects that we're talking about are 50-50. And it's important because in this last recent years, as Eric knows, the, the momentum has picked up because the state through the governor's initiative and others has really stepped up to match those funds. And really we didn't have that before. So the federal government was always waiting, waiting, you know, well, whenever we get this going. But now it's really moving forward because the state stepped up and said, we've got to have this appropriation. We've got to keep this moving. So the governor's really, really anxious about this as well, saying, look, I'm trying to keep the momentum going, keep putting up the state share to get this going. And he's he's being you know, told by the legislature they want to do something different. So we gotta we gotta get this straightened out this session and make sure it gets right. We will, and we, it's great to have a governor who um, is providing that necessary air cover to make sure that um, this oh, oh, doesn't doesn't turn out the way they want it. Um, great. Okay. Well, uh, I think we're we're at our time. Um, I want to thank you all for being here in person, and also those of you that are uh, joining us virtually. I'll just uh, conclude by saying um, we're here in Stewart, Martin County. Uh, where um, a lot of the activity over the years has occurred. Um, as we sit now on the 24th of February, 2022, um, we all need to reaffirm our, um, our commitment to this cause. I hope you all will join us in that. We, as we saw a couple of weeks ago in Tallahassee, we cannot, keep our, we cannot take our eye off the ball because the foot draggers are always attempting to, um, to stall. Um, but the good news is we're after it and we're gonna see restoration happen in our lifetime. And then to the new generation of river kids and others that are uh, the children of Florida, they will be the uh, protectors of the work that's being done perpetually. So it's uh, great to be with you all. Thank you for coming and enjoy your day.